There's a term that my brother and I use, he's also a writer, which is contain and sustain. People call the Die Hard on a bus. And I love Die Hard because it was a contained movie and it was sustained. So I was shooting for that. The moment where Keanu jumps from the Jaguar that he's commandeered onto the bus, I remember saying to myself, well, my life just changed. Welcome to Script Apart, a podcast about the first draft secrets of great movies. Each episode, a brilliant screenwriter revisits their initial screenplay for what became a beloved movie, discussing what changed, what didn't, and why. From first draft to the big screen. Okay, pop quiz hotshots. Which pedal to the metal Keanu Reeves blockbuster set a breakneck new pace for action cinema in 1994? The answer, of course, is speed. Directed by Jan de Bont and written by our guest today, the fantastic Graham Yost. Graham had the idea for the film after a conversation with his father about Akira Kurosawa's unproduced screenplay, Runaway Train. Taking the Japanese auteur's loose idea and throwing a bomb into the mix, the film saw Keanu star as Jack Traven, an LAPD officer tasked with saving a bus full of people from a device that will explode if the vehicle slows below 50 miles per hour. Full of nerve-shredding tension and death-defying set pieces, it's frequently voted among the best action movies of all time. And in my opinion, rightly so. I caught up with Graham, who you might also know for his work on TV shows like Justified and From the Earth to the Moon, to hear how he wrote Speed. We talk about his shockingly different original villain for the movie, the original way his first draft ended, the lines from the film that Joss Whedon punched up, and his pitches for two further Speed movies that sadly never got off the ground. It's a fascinating insight into how great action cinema is written, and also just a brilliant window into how one of the best films of the 90s came together. Before we dive into the episode though, a quick reminder that Script Apart is now on Patreon. Yes, for the price of a single cup of coffee a month, you can now support the show, submit your questions for upcoming guests, and best of all, get access to our brand new digital magazine. The magazine features 51 pages of interviews with incredible screenwriters, including exclusive conversations that you won't find anywhere else. Head to patreon.com forward slash script apart to get involved or click the link in today's show notes. Okay, that's the admin out of the way. Let's get into it with the incredible Graham Yost. A huge shout out to our Patreon subscribers. That includes Alice Sinclair, Susanna Wren and Rob Hollenby. You don't have to listen to this episode on a runaway bus tearing through traffic, but it might heighten the experience. Just throwing it out there. You're listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Hey Graham, so great to have you with us. How are you today? I'm doing fine. I am quarantining in a hotel room in London, hopefully getting out in a couple of days. So I'm afraid I'm going to be like a caged animal that's released and I'll continue to pace <laughs> within the imaginary confines of my hotel room. Um, no, it's been fine. Glad to hear it and glad to have you here with us today talking about what is without doubt one of my favorite action films of all time. I can't even begin to estimate the number of times I've watched this movie. Um, it's such an enduring film. What is it about Speed that struck a chord then, Graham, and continues to strike a chord today? You know, it's one of those things in movies where so much has to go right and usually so many things can go wrong. Um, I, I would say that the, the script was solid. Uh, it had great action sequences. It had really fun characters and all of that. I, I remember Mark Gordon, when he first read it, the, the first 10 pages in the um, elevator sequence, he went, oh, this is good. So it had that, but then we got Jan de Bont when he was ready to flex his muscles and be a director. And we got Keanu and, uh, and Sandra Bullock. So all of those things together, Mark Mancina's score, uh, the cinematography, uh, how they, it, there was, uh, you probably know the story about the freeway in Los Angeles that was about to open. So the film had to go into production that September or we were going to lose the freeway. So there was sort of an impetus to keep it going. And all of the, these things came together. I think, you know, what I contributed to it was uh, my part of the lightning in the bottle was the idea it was a bold high concept idea. That was a big term back in the 80s in screenwriting. It was slightly ludicrous if you spend any time in Los Angeles. Okay, incredibly ludicrous. Um, <laughs> as, as, as a friend liked to say to me, so um, in that bus, when they go out through the bottom, where's the, um, 
where's the transmission? Where's the transaxle? You know, because they there's like, oh, buses have escape hatches in them. You know, I mean, there's a lot of ludicrous stuff in it, uh, not to mention the bus jump. And I can walk through the physics of that, how I rationalize it to myself. But that was Jan DeMont's idea. But anyway, there, there's a term that my brother and I use. Uh, he's also a writer, which is contain and sustain. People call it Die Hard on a Bus. And I love Die Hard because it was a contained movie and it was sustained. I was shooting for that. Yeah. And I suppose it's such a fast paced movie that any logistical nitpicking that people want to do, you don't have time to do that because there's so much momentum in the plot. It moves so quickly and you're just drawn along for the ride, aren't you? Yes. And I think that uh, because of Keanu and because of, of Sa- I can call her Sandy. No, I'm, I've only <laughs> spent a little time with her in my life. But because of, of Sandra Bullock and all the other casting and because of the script and because of the rewriting that Joss Whedon did, um, which was even funnier than anything I had in there. The film built a great deal of goodwill so that the audience is willing to go with things. There was a big plot hole that I had not considered until I read it in Janet Maslin's review in the New York Times. I swear to God, I just hadn't thought of it, which is he's running after the bus. It hasn't yet gone 50. It's only going about 15, 20 miles an hour. He's chasing it. He's got a gun. Why doesn't he just shoot out the tires? And I didn't even think of that. Now, if we had thought of that, we would have had him pull his gun and get bumped by a car and his gun goes sliding under a, a bunch of cars. And now he's got no choice. We would have fixed it. But, we, you know, we didn't even think of it. Well, that never occurred to me. And I'm sure it didn't occur to 99 percent of people who saw it. It occurred to the woman who reviewed it in The New York Times. So that's <laughs> why Janet Maslin had her job. Yeah. But she still liked the movie. I mean, and, and I think that 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 was the thing. And. I remember the first time I saw it uh, in the, what's called the Little Theater on the Fox lot. I don't know if it exists anymore. The moment where Keanu jumps from the Jaguar that he's commandeered mm. onto the bus, I remember saying to myself, well, my life just changed because this is good. They've done a really good job. I don't know if it's going to make any money or be a big hit, but it's good. That's all a screenwriter could ask for. You actually tried to preempt a lot of the plot holes and some of the self-described ridiculousness of the film, didn't you? I mean, for example, Sandra Bullock's character was a driving instructor in the first draft, wasn't she? As a means of explaining how this random character would be so good behind the wheel of a bus. She was a driving instructor. She was a comedy driving instructor because I wanted to have... uh, You probably know my original casting ideas. Was it Halle Berry? Well, Halle Berry was the first person we went to. And when mm-hmm. I originally, well, okay, in the very first draft, her name was Darlene and she was an ambulance driver. And so she knew how to drive fast and she was just going to work downtown and she was black. She was African-American. And uh, I remember the studio saying, does she have to be black? And it's like, well, you know, I guess not. But this was back in 1991. And it's sort of like, okay, what they wanted was just, you know, uh, ethnically blind, just whoever. And then the first person we went to was Halle Berry and she didn't want to do it. But then I started thinking, uh, boy, what if she was funny? And I thought, well, there's this great female comedian, Ellen DeGeneres. And uh, she has since made a little hay over that. She found that out and did a whole funny bit on her show. But anyway, she's a very funny woman. I stand by that casting. No, we got Sandra Bullock, who is a very, very funny and uh, can do it all. Yeah, she gets a lot of opportunity to flex some of those comedy muscles, um, as we'll get to. Before we dive into the script itself, though, I'd love to know where the storytelling sensibility behind Speed came from. Because, well, I know that you grew up surrounded by cinema. Your dad was the host of Saturday Night at the Movies, which was a popular show on Canadian TV. Film obviously had a big part in your life from an early age. Um, How did that upbringing translate into you wanting to write movies and specifically a movie like Speed? One of the types of movies my dad really loved were great suspense thrillers. There is a, he's a British, no, he's maybe American um, director named Andrew Stone, who did these great sort of nail biting thrillers. One's called The Last Voyage. And it's got this sort of silly prologue at the middle, at the beginning. And then the very first thing, it's a captain who's sitting at the captain's table. It's a cruise ship and someone hands him a note and it says fire in the boiler room. And that's how the movie starts. I mean, that's the first scene is fire in the boiler room. And it goes from there. And so uh, I grew up loving those movies that were just tense, that everything kept on going wrong and people were trying to solve the problem. So when my dad told me about this Kurosawa script, And one of the things my dad would do is redirect movies in his head and redirect ideas. And he would, 
retell them in a way that was better than the original, but that's how he imagined it and remembered it. And so he said, I heard about the script where there's a train that can't slow down or it will blow up. And in the movie Runaway Train, based on Kurosawa's script, there's no bomb. They just can't get to the brakes. And it's in Alaska and all that stuff. And I came out thinking, boy, you know, that would have been better if there was a bomb and it'd be, it'd be better if it was a bus because I just felt that a train was just too linear. And I felt like the solutions were too easy on a train. You just get helicopters in and they land on the roof and they get the people off and it's fine. I just started thinking of all the problems and all the possible solutions and how the solutions could fail. So it was really built on that. And then I also knew I wanted it to be a romance between this woman who's going to drive the bus and this cop. But it went through many iterations. It eventually found its its way. It, it's, you know, like water finding its way. It, it ended up being the way it should have been, except for the fact that the whole subway sequence is completely superfluous, except it gets, to, it gets you to kill uh, the bad guy. Uh, <laughs> the, the emotional crest of the movie is when they get off the bus. Mm-hmm. You know, when it blows up and they're free, it's like everything after that is kind of like a bonus movie. Because they're in each other's arms. It's sort of, you know, in, in a, an old Hollywood film, that's all you need. But we had to have a subway sequence because Paramount wanted less time on the bus. And they were the original studio. Did you instantly know when you came up with the idea that you were onto something? I mean, it's it's the ultimate logline movie in a way. You can condense that entire premise into one sentence that's just exploding with dramatic potential. I mean, you must have had a sense that I'm onto something here, right? There was a little bit of, I better do this before someone else does it. I think this is a really solid idea. I did a bunch of outlines and I shared outlines with other writer friends because I I knew that it was a really good idea and I didn't want to screw it up. Interestingly for me, the uh, elevator sequence didn't come in until later in the game. It was something where, well, not too far late, but I think I don't know if it went into the outline or if it was when I started to write the script. And I thought, no, I need something to grab the audience right away. And I want to create a history with the bad guy and all this stuff. And we can talk about the various bad guy scenarios in the movie. I mean, that's, that was one of the big evolutions. But did I know? I knew if I didn't screw it up, it could be good. I think that I was an okay writer at that time. So I did a pretty good job executing it in that it was uh, an entertaining read. But I mean, it had its problems, but people bought it for the premise and the characters and the set pieces. Mm. It, it is interesting, though. I think there's a bit of a preconception with films like Speed that, um, that are based on such genius ideas that the rest of the movie must just tumble out of that eureka moment. Like the, the film must almost write itself. Um, but, but the more I've revisited the film over my lifetime, the more that I've come to appreciate that there's a lot going on beneath the surface of speed that contributes to the experience and essentially makes the difference between a great idea for a movie and a great movie full stop. Um, so yeah, Graham, how, how tricky was that task for you, finding a story that lived up to such a brilliant premise? Well, I mean, it did it, it take a bunch of outlines. And I think it, it, advice I give to young writers is you have to have this ability to do one of two things. One is abandon an idea if it's just not panning out and just put it on the shelf. And maybe you'll come back to it years later, or maybe you never will. And the other thing is something has got something to it. Stick with it and just keep going at it and do draft after draft after draft. I'm not one of the... Uh, you know, really strong writers out of the box. It took me a lot of of trial and error. My early scripts were not good. I always had an approach to character and dialogue that was entertaining, but it wasn't it wasn't brilliant, but it was good enough. But finding story structure and all of that and just going back at something. I mean, as I say, coming up with the elevator sequence was a matter of, yeah, this thing isn't this, it's not opening well. I I need it to open well. I need it to just grab people and then go. So there was a lot I learned by doing it. And I really listened to input from friends. I had a writing partner in Canada. He ended up becoming a professor of Shakespeare in British Columbia and a dean and all this stuff. But for a while, we wrote scripts together. I emailed him and I said, uh, Paul, I want to write this one by myself. And he said, fine, go do it. And then I wrote it and I I sent him the outline and originally I had it. You might know this little nugget, but the, the bus couldn't drop below 20. 
because I had this strange thing in my head that I wanted to be just faster than a human could run. Right. (laughs) And he said, who cares about that? Make it 50. That was one thing. And then I had a whole problem with the money drop. And so he said, well, he had already had had this idea of how he would, if he was to ransom something, how he would do a money drop. And he gave me the garbage can with the hole in the sidewalk thing, which it turns out other people are like, oh, I've heard that one before. And it's like, hey, OK. <laughs> um, but um, so that was Paul, Paul Boudry. I think he thought I was going to buy him a car or at some point. I didn't do anything. I think I you know, bought him lunch <laughs> in, British, in British Columbia. But Buying him a bus would be more fitting. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he'd be like, what the hell am I going to do with a <laughs> bus? What I, what, this is a nightmare. The opening scene there, the, the elevator scene that, as you say, wasn't in your original draft, wasn't in sort of your early outlines. What did you think it added? I don't know, it's almost like Indiana Jones-esque to me. It, it does some heavy lifting in terms of story and character that we don't appreciate till later on in the film. We meet uh, Howard Fisk, as he's called in the script, and we see him shove a knife through the ear of a security guard on the first page. So that establishes his ruthlessness. We meet SWAT officer Jack Traven and his partner Harry. So we get a glimpse into their relationship that makes Harry's fate in the script later all the more impactful. And we also get a glimpse into who Jack is, his competence at what he does, his mentality, his determination. What was it that you wanted to set up in this early exchange that was better to you, that worked better on the page than going straight into the bus plot? Um, I wanted to establish that they were problem solvers, that they would be presented with a dilemma and they would figure their way around it. They would. So because the whole story is basically it's a, one problem after another. And how do you solve this? And how do you then solve that? And what's the trick? Uh, you know, I'm talking to younger writers. I always talk about how, um, you know, the great heroes are not the smartest. They're not the strongest necessarily, but they are clever and they figure out the trick. So Perseus, when he's going after Medusa, figures out, I will look at her reflection and I will kill her in the reflection, because if I look at her, she's going to turn me to stone. So he figures out the trick. So Jack keeps on trying to figure out the trick throughout the whole thing. He's not the strongest, the fastest or anything like that. He's just clever. And I think the audiences really get a kick out of that. And now I honestly can't remember what your question is. (laughs) I am starting to crash from jet lag. Who was that character to you, Jack? You know, he evolved. There, There was this odd film with Jeff Bridges called um, Cutter's Way. And when it first came out, it was called Cutter and Bone. And, you know, he's walking around with a cane. And originally when I wrote Jack, he had screwed up his leg and something and he had a cane and a brace and he was taking pain pills and stuff. I was going gritty, you know, and then it was like, (laughs) yeah, we don't need that. And frankly, when when Mark Gordon, um, the producer and Allison Zegan, uh, Allison, yeah, um, Allison Line at that point, and uh, we met with Keanu. It was like, oh yeah, no, that's that's what the that's what the character is going to be. It's going to be that guy with that haircut. He's just going to bulk up a little bit, but he's already six foot two, incredibly handsome, charming, and very smart. So you know, some of us sort of shifted in that direction just because of who we had. I think it's worth mentioning at this point that the title at this point in the development of Speed oh, was here not we go. Speed. Here, all, everyone loves to say this one. All my friends go, yeah, never forget. He called it minimum speed at first. <laughs> yeah, what an idiot. And it's like, yeah, no, it, you know. Well, it's like, like I say about, and I don't know if we'd ever you'd bring up this one, but Speed 2, which I had nothing to do with. Yeah. But, you know, the, the, the subtitle is Cruise Control. And Cruise control is what you do when you're <laughs> bored and you're just in your car and you don't want to worry about pressing the pedal down. It's it's yeah, it's just you're locked in. It's there's nothing. Uh, it's autopilot so, essentially. Yeah, it's autopilot, and and so uh, minimum speed in in that regard was not so bad. No, it was bad. It was a bad title. As I, I realized, I, I think I don't know if anyone said it to me or if I realized it was just like you don't want the word minimum in your title, no matter what. (laughs) That's just maximum speed, fine. Minimum speed, no. And um, throughout all these early drafts, you always had a partner for Jack, didn't you? You always had Harry. Yes. Now, are we going to tell the Harry story now? Let's get into it. Yeah. So Harry, uh, I think we can reveal at this point, he originally was, was going to be the bad guy pulling all the strings. 
So, yes, he, the, the idea was that he's not the bad guy in the elevator sequence, but that he conjures up, that guy just dies, but that he conjures up as if that guy had returned because he, Jack shot him and his life went to hell. And so Harry creates this thing that he can solve and he can get revenge on Jack. And here's the reason. I maintain that these movies generally, the best of them, have great bad guys. When I was a kid growing up, Auric Goldfinger was a great bad guy. Blofeld was a great bad guy. Dr. No was a little weird, but you know, these a lot of the bad guys were really were really good. And the best of all is is Hans Gruber. I mean, I don't think there's ever been a bad guy as good as good as that. Uh, he, you know, Rickman was just just perfect and it was so well written. And so I was writing the movie with with Die Hard in mind. And so I thought, man, Jack and the bad guy aren't going to have any time together. You know, it's maybe over a phone or something like that. And it won't have that mano a mano thing going on in Die Hard. They came up with that scene between uh, McLean and Hans Gruber late in the day. I think they were already shooting when they came up with that idea. Yeah. Uh, And it's one of the great scenes in the movie. At any rate, what I did not entirely calculate was that when you cast Dennis Hopper, half of the job is taken care of because he's just so interesting. You know, he's uh, I, I, used to, I said he was America's favorite madman at the time. So uh, the, the other thing was, you know, the, what we called the Harry version lasted until until the summer before we started shooting, people were on board with it. They liked the twist. It was interesting. All of that, where you find out that Harry's been pulling the strings and all of that. And then, um, and Mark Gordon hates this part, but eh, because two other producers came in, Walter Parks and, and Laurie McDonald, and they ended up running um, DreamWorks for years. And, you know, Walter and his, his partner wrote war games and stuff like that. Anyway, very smart film people. And they said, you know, the Harry version may be doable, but I don't think you've got the time. I don't think you've got the real estate. I think you just need a bad guy. So that was the big switch that summer before we started shooting. And that was this, you know, in terms of the story of who did the rewrites and stuff, that's when I was brought back for a very short period before Joss Whedon came in and took it mm-hmm. to the, uh, to production. But yeah, that was a big, that was a big shift. Let's just make it, let's just make it Howard Payne. Um, I think I called him Howard Fisk because of, I'm trying to remember. Oh yeah. I think we'd moved to a street called Fisk at that point. I was like, Oh, I don't know. I'm terrible at names. It was, it was, it was an attempt, but, but Hopper was, he was fantastic. Yeah. And it's interesting, as you say, sort of, you know, screenwriting 101, they always encourage you to have physical on-screen time between hero and villain. But I don't know, like the middle act of this film is essentially two smart people trying to outsmart each other. There's not the option for there to be physical altercations between them. Instead, you have Jack with the CCTV in the bus and you've got Howard always trying to kind of one up him and be one step ahead of him. I don't know. It's um, It forced you in a way to make their battle one of wit and intellect yeah. instead of physicality. So yeah. I, I don't know. It, it kind of made for a better film, I suppose. I, I, I think it did. And I, and I think honestly... It, what you have to remember is it was shooting in 1993 mobile cell phones were not that old. So people, young people who see this movie go, what's, what's he talking into when he's on the bus? Cause he's got this brick. <laughs> Even then it wasn't one of the huge ones. It wasn't like, uh, Oh God, in wall street, uh, you know, Michael Douglas and when this like just gigantic um, phone. <laughs> so when you're reading it on the page and I'm imagining it, I'm not seeing these two people together, but when you see it, they are together because you're cutting fat back and forth between yeah. the ends of the phone calls and they have this connection and they're, they're talking about things um, that are happening at that moment. So it ended up working f- partly for that reason too. But again, talking about screenwriting 101, you're told as a writer to torture your characters and Graham, you torture Jack by making him undergo the entire ordeal on the bus hung over. <laughs> you, uh, you describe him waking up bleary eyed, gulping down aspirin like it's candy after you know what? This that's, that's i, I that's joss that's joss. that joss so the one, the one scene that joss the one actual scene that joss really added was mm. the scene after the hero ceremony and they get their medals and they go out and they drink right okay that was it. so i mean he was really not happy that he didn't get shared writing credit and in a fairer world 
Um, there used to be old credits in, in Hollywood movies, additional dialogue by, or, you know, there could have been a version where I got story and we shared screenplay or something like that, but the guild didn't see it that way. And, you know, I made my arguments, he made his arguments and he lost his case and he was not happy about that. I mean, we sort of buried the hatchet at a point, but then, you know, he's, he's still gone on over the years and, and had threatening letters sent to him by the writer's guild saying, you know, you're not supposed to talk about this stuff. And in fact, I'm probably not supposed to talk about it. And uh, so if I get thrown in the WGA jail for saying it on this podcast, um, it's been nice knowing <laughs> I, I'm used to it now. I think it's common knowledge that, you know, for example, pop quiz, hot shot, that kind of enduring line, that was the sort of thing that he came in and sort of- My line was far boringer, boringer. And see, when, when someone says a word like boringer, you know that he's not a great writer. <laughs> and he's really just made us get through this by, by bluff and bullshit. Um, it was like, okay, Jack, here's a scenario. Guy comes into a bank, he's got a hospital, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it was just, they were just talking over scenarios. Hmm. And I don't know if I'd read about cops talking about scenarios. I can't remember, but it was just- that was the thing. And it was Joss pop quiz hotshot. So this is one of those little things in life where people will come up to me and go, hey, pop quiz hotshot. And I go, oh, thanks. And inside I'm going, not my line. That's <laughs> Joss's. But did you like the scene of him going under the bus? Did you like the bus having to make the hard right turn? Did you like the bus going <laughs> against traffic? That's me. Um, <laughs> do you like the jump onto the bus? Do you like, you know, getting up? Oh, that, that's that's my shit. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the uh, but pop quiz hotshot is not me. Mm. It's on. So I'm going to I'm going to stop the interview right now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, it's on um, page thirty that we get what you'd call the inciting incident right on cue. The bus explodes. A phone rings, and Jack picks it up. It's a familiar voice, Howard from the elevator incident. Pop quiz hotshot. There's a bomb on a bus. Once the bus hits 50 miles an hour, the bomb is armed. If the bus drops below 50, it blows up. What do you do? So once you had this set up, you, you mentioned earlier that you part of your process was to think about all the things that could happen, all the sort of obstacles that might get in their way that might threaten to slow this bus down. How did that process work? Did you literally, did you jump on public transport for a day and well, kind of yeah, observe the things? I like to say that the guy who wrote Speed 2 was put on a cruise ship for two weeks. <laughs> I rode a bus on my own dime from Santa Monica, downtown Los Angeles, crossed the street and got the next bus back to Santa Monica. That was my research. I also walked around a bus yard in Santa Monica and saw how they clean buses. That was actually fun, um, but <laughs> didn't make it into the movie. Yeah, it was, uh, it was just what can go wrong and then how do you solve it? And how does the solution then turn into something bad? And then how do you solve that? And it just became one thing after another. So I knew I wanted him on the, and riding that bus, I could see that the traffic moved fine for the, an early morning bus out of Santa Monica, headed downtown, moves fine up until about Fairfax. And then the traffic starts. So I knew they're going to have to get off. Well, now it's a city street thing. Okay. Well, what about, I'm going to steal from to live and die in LA. I'm going to have them going the wrong way down the wrong side of the street. Okay, we'll do that. And it just kept on. Okay, what else? Get, oh, a hard right turn. How do you how do you make a turn at 50 miles an hour? A hard right turn. Okay, everybody on this side of the bus and and you know figuring all of that out. You, do you know the story of the baby carriage? You know, it was just someone at Fox. I always thought it was Peter Chern and he's since denied it. But I always thought it was him who said, "Hey, couldn't it almost hit a baby carriage at some point?" And I said to the executive, no, we, that's such a cliche. We can only make it work if it actually hit the baby carriage. But we can't do that. We can't kill a kid. And then I remembered seeing someone collecting cans in a park in New York in a shopping cart. And I thought, what if they used a baby carriage? And that, you know, and that became writing that scene and being in a theater with an audience watching that scene. That was like, that's what's great about movies. That was fantastic because they they had that moment of oh! and you see <laughs> 500 people just going oh! and then cans. It's just cans. And it's like, well, that's Jan DeBont directing the hell out of it. It's Sandra, it's Keanu, it's everything. So, you know, when you were kind of uh, putting together this this list of things that could happen and obstacles that could get in the bus's way, was there anything that you had on that list that didn't make it into the movie that you entertained? Have you ever heard about the Baker sequence, as we called it? It's no. The, okay. Well, we called it the Baker sequence because it was this character named Baker. 
<laughs> and Jan was so heartbroken when we couldn't do this because we we came up with this all together. And what it was was that uh, Keanu Jack gets a cell phone, calls in. This is the situation. And they send a helicopter and they drop a guy on a line and he hooks on to the bus and he's climbing in. And then they see, oh, shit, there's a bridge coming up. We can't and he can't get the line unhooked. And now it's going to pull down the helicopter and he's hustling and he gets the line. And he goes up in the air and they he just clears the railing on a bridge. But just then there's a truck with plate glass you know, on it and <laughs> gets shredded by the glass. And it was this big sequence, but it was like, I don't know, $2 million, $5 million or something to do that. And I was like, mm. no, we can't afford it. We got to cut the Baker sequence. And it's, it's interesting because it would have been spectacular, but it's not about Jack. It's about yeah. another character. And we were just going to introduce him. He was what, what I wanted out of it was here's the real hot shot SWAT guy in the SWAT gear. I'm the SWAT guy and I'm cool and I'm dropping down from a helicopter and I'm military kind of thing. And he dies and Jack keeps going. And that was the whole point of it. But um, yeah, no, we just couldn't afford it. It's in the next scene that we meet Annie, um, played, of course, by Sandra Bullock, who is ironically having to get the bus because she had her driver's license revoked for speeding. Um, on this bus, we meet so many great characters. It's this real cross-section of LA. I particularly love Doug Stevens, the annoying tourist. From this moment on, though, we're on the bus and it's just action beat after action beat, starting with Jack hijacking that car and racing after the bus. Um, let's talk for a moment about your approach to action in this movie. When when you write, do you think it's all about how difficult a stunt will be to pull off? Or do you just let your imagination run wild because, hey, that's the director's problem. They can figure out how to bring it to life. Uh, yeah, it was pretty much that's the director's problem. It also, it was not stuff that, th there were certain things that hadn't been done before, perhaps, but a lot of it was just a, a putting together in a different way, things that we'd seen in movies, you know, we'd seen car chases before. So, you know, you could do high speed stuff in cities. The freeway was a problem. Solving that was a big problem plus for the movie. You might have read about, I think there were 12 or 14 buses used. There was one bus that was just for Jack going underneath it. That's all it did. There was one bus to go make the turn. That's all it did. It could go up on, it had a separate set of wheels on the outside. So it would actually just, it could just drive down the street like that on its side, sort of. Uh, there was, you know, a couple of buses for the jump. There was buses that were set up to shoot from the inside out and from the outside, others from the outside in. There was some to shoot from a distance with no, uh, you know, equipment on it. So a lot of it was them figuring out, you know, how to do the bus tricks. And um, when I heard how they were doing them, I was just, you know, it's one of those things like, wow, we're all pulling in the same direction. Everyone's into figuring out how to make this work. There's no one's half-assing it. They're like, well, no, this could be really fun. Let's 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 do that. Let's figure that out. Obviously, the biggest action beat of the film is that unfinished freeway jump. That was the real money shot of the movie that led so many of the trailers and I think featured on quite a few of the posters. But that wasn't, as far as I'm aware, in your early drafts. No. Uh, yeah, how did that come about then? That that was Jan. He said, I really want something that feels like a brick wall that there's no way they can survive this. And I'm thinking, what? Well, they, we already just did a hard right turn. We went the wrong way in traffic. We've been in the freeway, you know. But he came up with other stuff too. It was like when they're getting off the freeway, before they get off the freeway, he's, they, they slam into a car that shoots up the, the ramp of a tow truck and over the top and everything, which actually doesn't make any sense because the bus would have, anyway. But it looked cool. But he said, we need something that's, that's uh, you know, essentially feels like it's a wall that they can't get past. And he might have said a jump or I said a jump. And then we just, you know, worked out this idea. What if there's an, well, okay, we're on a freeway. And, and we used the 105 in LA, which has now been in use for 25 years. But at the time, it had yet to open. And so we said, let's build on that. Let's say that they end up on the 105. Oh, but they haven't, for some reason, they built an entire freeway, but they decided to not close this one gap because they were thinking maybe a movie would need to shoot on this. No, anyway, so he, uh, <laughs> we came up with that. 
I, I built all sorts of logic into it that there'd been a pile of dirt at the end they were using to mix cement so it would get a pop up and stuff like that. And Jan was like, no, I don't care. We don't care. Just have her floor it. And then I came out with a logic that if the bus is 40 feet long and the gap is 50, that it's going to hit and then it's going to sort of scrape along and then pop up and go like that. He said, no, I don't care. And he's right. You just don't care. I mean, it's one of those things where the audience sees it and they know it is complete movie bullshit. (laughs) But they don't care by that point because everything else has felt real enough. And the characters are fun and the music's great and it's shot beautifully. Um, So... They just went with it. One thing that we haven't touched on throughout all this, Annie and Jack's relationship is blossoming as they kind of are bonded together by crisis after crisis. How did you thread that needle of finding room for them to kind of get to know each other and grow closer without letting up the pace of the movie? My whole thing was I wanted these two strangers to come together out of uh, mutual respect and trust. And that the moment when Jack gets off the bus to then come back and try and go under it and disarm the bomb, that there's a look between them where it's just, it's a little bit like you're, she's upset. You're leaving me, but you get that sense. I'll be back. And they've just been through this thing together and they can trust each other. And, and I, I thought that that was, you know, as I, I love the old Hollywood films where, you know, at the end of 39 Steps, Hero and the heroine, just their hands touch. And that's it. You know that they're going to get married and have a life together. You don't need to see anything more. And you don't need to see them having sex. You don't need to see them kiss. You just know from that point on. And so I wanted that with them. Now, as it turns out, you get these two young, very attractive people. You want to see them kiss and, and talk about sex. So, okay. But you know, <laughs> that wasn't my original intent. I'm a prude. I'm Canadian. <laughs> So your original draft, they were on the bus the entire time. Yeah. And it, as far as I'm aware, you can correct me if I'm wrong. It was the studio that said they should get off the bus and there should be something else. And yeah. you, you landed on this subway sequence, which is in keeping with, you know, it's, it's one public transport disaster one, to another. One form of public transportation after another. Yeah. I guess first of all, I should ask. What was the original ending? The, the original ending was just them getting off the bus. And, and it just, it was a shorter script. And it, uh, you might know that, and I don't know how well you know LA, but I just looked at a map. Where could they drive around in a circle? And I saw Dodger Stadium has this big road all the way around the stadium you know, through all the parking lots. And I thought that's perfect. And that was scripted and that, and then the people who owned the uh, Dodgers at the time owned the stadium and the parking lots. They said, yeah, no, we're not going to have a terrorist film shot at Dodger Stadium. <laughs> So they scouted other ideas and they came up with the idea of, of the airport. And um, and that then allowed, you know, Yon to have a big explosion, which makes no fucking sense. But it's it's <laughs> it's fine. It's cool. You want to see something blow up. But yeah, it's, it's this weird thing of like, well, we've been waiting the whole time for this bus to blow up. But now it hits a plane and it's kind of is it the plane blowing up or is it, you know, the audience doesn't care. They don't even care that you can see the tow cables on the rattling around on the pavement because we didn't have enough money to paint them out. Um, yeah, that's one thing. Like they, one of the brilliant things when they did the CG shot of the the uncompleted freeway overpass is that they put some birds in, which just made gave it some depth and made it feel like that. That CG shot cost like three hundred thousand dollars at the time. Now it could be done by one of you guys in your basement, you know, for <laughs> forty bucks. Um, but that's what it was thirty years ago. So to, to me, it was Subway, and okay, I can I can flip it around. I can have Jack meet the bad guy. They can have a face to face thing. I came up with the idea of the fight on top of a train. I thought that would be cool. I mean, I had a whole fantasies that they were going to build a false ceiling kind of thing on like. A, a conveyor belt. So we'd have a sense of, cause I wanted the idea of having to have a fight where you've only got two and a half feet to fight in. What, how would that fight go? It didn't really turn out like that, but you know, we got to decapitate them. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, as I say, it is such a, a satisfying ending and it leaves on a pretty concrete note. You allude to this like bright future for the couple and it seemed to be a self-contained story Of course, there was a sequel. As you mentioned, you didn't work on it. Was that because you were busy with other projects or did you have a a sense that this was a story that didn't need further installments? Oh, no, no, no. I had I had pitches. Oh, no, I had like 
one on a boat that was going to be called full speed and one on a plane that was going to be called high speed. No, I, ha- I had all these other ideas. They, no, it, by that point, Jan was the star and he was the auteur. And so he got to call the shots and, you know, he wanted to do it without me. I mean, he'd had a good experience with, with Josh, but Josh didn't work on it. I forget actually who wrote it, but that that's not cool of me. But, you know, listen, it was it, my good line at the time was I was not invited to a party I didn't want to go to. And it, it just it was just not a good movie. What can you remember about your pitch for Full Speed? Full Speed was going to be transporting music- musicians, uh, munitions left over from the Vietnam War on a on a like a a boat in the Pacific Ocean and then they hit a storm, but they find out it's got phosphorus in it and the water hits it, it's going to blow up. And then high speed was another bad guy and you can't drop below 10,000 feet and you're running out of fuel and you're headed into the Andes. Now what do you do? And Jack was on board both. I can't remember. And then, you know, Mark Gordon and I did a, a, a film that was not that successful, unfortunately, uh, that we called The Flood and came out as Hard Rain with Christian Slater and Morgan Freeman. We actually, when we had that idea, we pitched it to Fox. What if this is Jack and Annie? It's, so it's not a speed related thing. They just get caught and they're going back to visit her family in the Midwest and they get caught up in this thing. And they said, no, we're doing what Jan wants to do. And then Keanu wouldn't do it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, wow. That does sound lots of fun. But as it happened, I mean, speed really did infiltrate pop culture. I mean, one of my favorite ever Simpsons jokes that I'm sure you get relayed to all the time is when Homer describes seeing a movie in which a bus has to speed around a city, keeping its speed above 50. If its speed drops below that number, the bus explodes. I think it was called the bus that couldn't slow down. (laughs) Um, I'm not sure if it made it over the pond, but in the UK, we had a show called Father Ted that based an entire episode on speed, except from the bus was strapped to a milk float on a remote Irish island. It couldn't go below four miles per hour. So yeah, there have been so many homages. Are there any kind of pop culture responses to the movie that you remember particularly loving? The big one for me was David Letterman did a top 10 list of other rejected titles for speed. And uh, I, my agent got the original thing that they printed up and it was just a white piece of paper with, you know, printing on it that he would look at on his desk. Um, so I've got that framed at home. Oh, that's great. <laughs> It still has that power today, the film. I mean, only a couple of weeks ago, I saw someone go viral on Twitter with a clip of the scene on the bus. Everyone is yelling at each other. And the caption was essentially, speed predicted Twitter. This is exactly what being on Twitter is like. So it obviously still has this influence. How do you think speed moved the needle in terms of American cinema, action cinema? I know it was part of a wave of extremely influential action movies in the 90s many of which shared, you know, members of the same creative team, yourself, Keanu, DeBont. But was there like a a legacy to speed success specifically, would you say? Yeah, my wife and I got to move with her kids up to uh, Carmel, California and (laughs) built a nice house. I mean, it was that way because I I think the legacy is simply that people enjoy it and they still enjoy it and it'll slowly fade out. I mean, I, I remember when we first moved up there, I would go talk to kids in seventh and eighth grade and they'd all seen speed and after a few years you know maybe their older brother had seen speed and then i came back and no one knew what it was and it's just like it's time to retire that story you know so (laughs) but i'm happy that people still enjoy it there is a structure to it there's a humor to it you know the tension is not too and it's also not it's not um blood blood and guts tension Mm. Someone is being tortured. Someone's about to be shot. Someone's, it's just, it really is a disaster film on a bus. It's not that different from, from the Poseidon adventure. The Poseidon adventure, the boat's upside down. They've got to solve that problem. And this is, there's a bomb on the bus. We've got to solve that problem. So that's about it. Well, Graham, you've enjoyed an incredible career since Speed. I'm interested to know, given, you know, your work on TV over recent years, and well, just the nature of Hollywood, the way that beloved films and IPs tend to come back around in this business before too long. 
Could you hypothetically see Speed being revived as a TV series or anything like that? Or is the pacing of TV too novelistic to stay true to that breakneck pace of Speed? I think about 15 years ago, Mark Gordon and I teamed up with a couple of young writers and we were going to do Speed the series. We just couldn't get it off the ground. It was just going to be a SWAT show. And the idea was we were just going to use the title, but it was going to be a different kind of SWAT dilemma every week. But it's that kind of puzzle solve thing. How do you how do you, you know, if someone does this, what do you do kind of kind of show? It didn't end up going anywhere. And, you know, about five, eight years ago, Mark and I, and his, his team, we kicked around ideas for a speed three. And we even talked to Keanu about it. And he was, eh. you know, it, I think part of it is, there. I'll be honest, which is there was a feeling of sadness and burnout that speed two was such a bad film. And it sort of it killed the franchise if it was a possible franchise. I think that it, it saved us from killing it ourselves. Because Mark and I would have come up with something, whether it was high speed or full speed or something else, it just wouldn't have been as good. Because he's not James Bond. He's not born. You know, he's he's not Ethan Hunt. It's not that kind of transportable character in the thing. It was the whole experience of it. And to try and repeat that would feel like it was repeating it. That said, if I got a shot to work with Keanu and, and, and Sandy again, absolutely. Um, they love each other. You know, they, they've got a great friendship and uh, it'd be fun to do something with them again. Yeah, yeah. Well, Graham, this has been such a blast. And uh, yeah, as I say, I'm a huge admirer of this film and all your work. So I can't thank you enough for coming on the show to discuss this incredible movie. Before you leave, I should ask, you know, you mentioned you're in London at the minute, you're working on new projects. Presumably you're not here just to uh, check out the John Lewis French press section that we were talking about <laughs> off air. Um, yeah. Well, can you tell me about what's coming up from you? Um, you know, I work for Apple now. So I did for Justified and then Sneaky Pete, I was working at Sony. And then the guys who ran Sony started Apple TV Plus. And so I've been with them for two years now. And the stuff that I started two years ago, started on is now in various phases of production. I was working on the World War II thing, Masters of the Air. And then I had to step away from that because this other thing I'm working on is going to go into production this summer. And I'm also a, a producer on the uh, Slow Horses series, which is uh, Gary Oldman playing Jackson Lamb uh, in the series of British spy novels by Mick Herron, um, that I just fell in love with. And so was so happy that I could have any involvement in that. Um, that's written primarily by Will Smith and Marwenna Banks and Mark Denton and Johnny, uh, Johnny Stockwood. So that's one of the reasons I'm over because we're now working on what would be the third block of six, which is the third book that Nick wrote. Yeah. So between that and then this other thing, which is a post-apocalyptic dystopian thing about the last 10,000 people on earth living in an underground silo starring Rebecca Ferguson, who I fell in love with the first time I saw her in, in, uh, in Mission Impossible. I was like, who the hell is that? <laughs> and then it's like, oh, we're talking together on Zoom. And once I get out of quarantine, hopefully we're going to get together and have dinner. So that's what that's what I'm doing. It's a bunch of stuff, but um, yeah, I've had I've you know I've, I've I've been very lucky to work on a lot of different things, and that's the thing. I'm a lucky bastard, so I, I enjoy what I do. I enjoy getting to do this. Exciting stuff. Well, Graham, I'm looking forward to all those projects, and I can't thank you enough for coming on Script Apart to talk about Speed, a movie that I have loved for many decades and will continue to love for many decades more. You got it, guys. Thanks so much. Okay, take care. You've been listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.